features of these disruptive technologies are that they've got initially poor performance that can become good performance, but usually actually not. They appeal to niche customers first. And competition also comes from the low end. Remember, the customers who are being most attracted by this are your worst customers, the ones that you have to fight hardest to convince to buy your product. Okay, So when competition comes, they come from what is called the low end. And there's a good reason for that. In order for a disruptive entrant to attract those customers, they usually have to have a low price. And low price is associated with the low end. And here is the first clue as to where we've got a problem with the iPhone. Steve Ballmer was right. The iPhone was not at the low end. It was a $500 plone with a plan. Okay, that is as high end as you are going to get in that market. So something is amiss right there. Okay. How then did it become cheap enough to actually have an impact on these cheaper phone makers? Okay. And the answer was, it wasn't uh, Apple alone. Google took the similar design, came in with a cheaper phone, with the Android system. It was designed to be cheaper because Google had other things on its mind other than selling phones. Okay. So the mechanism that uh, can explain this, oh, so the big issue here is, yes, they didn't respond to Apple, but when Android came in, why didn't these guys respond? Or more particularly, why did they take so long to do so? Okay. What stopped them? Now, I outline in the book that they all eventually realized there was something interesting going on. And no one quicker than RIM. RIM was the first to develop a product that looked like an iPhone with a, a touch screen and a very innovative key design that clicked. The whole screen clicked as you, as you typed and things like that. And it got a deal with Verizon and it got several million sales out of it. But we never hear about it today. Okay? So they did respond. But they didn't successfully respond. They didn't take all of their advantages and translate them into something that could beat Apple, which a lot of people were betting was possible. So the mechanism is not a demand side one. We will look to the supply side. Was there something going on inside these firms that was making it hard for them to respond? And was that something related to what made them successful in the first place? And the answer, I think, is yes. So it wasn't that uh, the iPhone was a disruptive innovation. It was a different sort of innovation, which had been invented and analyzed around the same time as Clayton Christensen, maybe a few years earlier, called an architectural innovation. An architectural innovation is an innovation in how things are put together. It's like, you know, often Apple is criticized for not having anything new. Right? A lot of the things in even the iPhone, including multi-touch, etc., were not new. But what Apple had done somewhere along the line and put it together in a different way, okay, in a way that appealed. And that's what is an architectural innovation is. An architectural innovation presents established firms with a more subtle challenge. Much of what the firm knows is useful and needs to be applied in the new product, but some of what it knows is not only not useful, but may actually handicap the firm. Recognizing what is useful and what is not and acquiring and applying new knowledge when necessary may be quite difficult for an established firm because of the way knowledge, particularly architectural knowledge, is organized and managed. This concept was invented by Rebecca Henderson and Kim Clark. Rebecca Henderson was a PhD student at Harvard around the same time as Clay Christensen. There was something clearly in the air about this issue. And she studied the same phenomena of successful firms running into trouble because they seem to be following good practices. These practices were not good marketing practices. These practices were good product development practices and organization inside the firm. And the best one of these that was uh, followed was the idea that you should divide your product, once you know what it's all about, into different teams and let those teams operate on their own so that they aren't hampered by some meddling manager at the top. That is good product management. 